millions of people in the world's poorest countries remain imprisoned, enslaved, and in chains. They are trapped in the prison of poverty. It is time to set them free. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made, and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. Good evening, everyone here in, uh, in Baskin Ridge, the Tech Symposium, everybody on the Instagram, uh, around the world, wherever you are. Uh, fantastic to be here, and uh, so exciting to have you, Evans, here. Uh, you heard about this CV, you know, the young Australian of the year. You're still very young, so it has to be very recently. <laughs> I'm a bit older now. Uh, you're a bit older now, yeah. but long CV, and I met you for many, many years ago, and uh, I have to say, it's an exciting journey he has done, and we're going to hear about that tonight. And uh, I usually say when I meet people and I'm going to interview them, uh, even if they're going to have a job interview with me, I usually start by talking about their childhood, the background, because ultimately that is what is making you a different person and how you behave and your characteristic. And I think there's no one else that I should actually ask that question to you about your background when you were young, what happened and what was the important uh, stages of your young life that actually formed what you have done so far in your life? Well, firstly, thank you, Hans, for having me and thank you to your team at Verizon for the great opportunity to be with you. It's wonderful to be with you again. And as you mentioned, we met many, many years yeah. ago and it's awesome to be with you, so thank you. Uh, our, our mission at Global Citizen is all about seeing the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. And that sounds like a really bold vision, but for me it started very simply. I was 12 years old, I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. I don't know if any of you folks have had visited <laughs> Australia before, but you have, awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was just, you know, a 12 year old kid in my first year of high school. And one day a lady from an aid organization called World Vision came and spoke at our school about raising money to support their work. And when you're 12 years old, you get a bit excited. And I put up my hand and I thought, how cool would it be if we could raise the most amount of money of any school in the country? And when I was 14, we achieved that goal together. And so they sent me uh, to the Philippines to see their work firsthand. And there was one night in the Philippines that changed my life forever, where we were taken onto this slum in the center of Manila called Smoky Mountain. It's an entire community that's built on top of a rubbish dump. So the very infrastructure of this whole community revolves around scavenging. So the kids literally run after the garbage trucks every single day to try to get bits of scrap metal, piece of food, and things that they can recycle. And uh, that night, I was placed in the care of a kid my own age. We were both 14. His name is Sunny Boy. And where I'd come from, you know, middle class Melbourne in Australia, Sonny Boy, he had tattoos on his arm at the age of 14 years old because he's about to become his gang leader. And each of these tattoos was his form of initiation. And that night he took me to his house with this, he took me to this house built on top of the rubbish dump and I had no idea what to expect that night. And I, I remember I said to him, where are we going to go to sleep? And when it came time to go to sleep, we just cleared away the pots and pans on the ground and we lay down, myself, Sonny Boy, and the rest of his family, seven of us in this long line. And we lay there that night with the smell of rubbish all around us because we're lying on top of a garbage dump. 
and cockroaches crawling all over us. And I didn't sleep at all. I, I lay awake thinking to myself, you know, it really is pure chance that I was born where I was born and he was born where he was born. As, uh, as Warren Buffett once put it, the ovarian lottery. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I couldn't sleep at all. And I, I came back and I said to my mum as soon as I got back, I said, mum, I've got to see what I can do to eradicate extreme poverty. But when you're only 14 years old, you don't know where to begin. <laughs> and it wasn't until a few years later, I went to live the next year in India for a year by myself. I went to the Himalayan mountains to a school called Woodstock School in Utt Uttarakhand, northern India. I got a scholarship and I started trying to immerse myself in understanding what would it take to address these issues. I saw that the scale of extreme poverty was so much that we couldn't just t think about it through traditional charitable terms. So I graduated from high school and I decided to spend my first year out and I went to live in South Africa at an orphanage in KwaZulu-Natal in the Valley of a Thousand Hills. This is the epicenter of the world's HIV AIDS pandemic. One in three people so in the- how old were you? 19 and 20. And, the, and, and I was living at an orphanage for 100 children orphaned by HIV AIDS in the region. And that was a tipping point year for us because I, I, I read Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom that year and he talks about how education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. And so I came back to Australia and at the end of that experience decided to start Australia's first youth run aid organization focused on trying to really use the power of education to transform lives. And that was really where it kicked off for me. And um, yeah. Wow. So somewhere along the lines when you saw all these type of events in your life, you just decided that this is my mission in life. I mean, this is really what I want to do. And you started early with your fundraising, your foundations and things like that at a very early age. Well, well what happened after that is I, was, I went back and, and started studying law in Melbourne. And we, I, I was determined to see how we could approach these issues on a systemic level, not just through traditional charitable giving. And so we saw that the G20 was coming through Melbourne, mm. Australia one day. And me and my mate Dan had this idea to run this small concert called the Make Poverty History Concert. And one day it exploded when I got a phone call from Bono <laughs> and Pearl Jam, and they said that they wanted to headline our show. <laughs> and, and I thought it was a prank call. I didn't believe it until they came on first, as you can see, and sang uh, Rockin' in the Free World by Neil Young. You were so and we were excited. I was, I was so excited. <laughs> and, and, uh, and a million Australians convinced our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, to double foreign aid. We raised $6.2 billion in new foreign aid that year. It was the largest foreign aid contribution Australia's ever had. And off the back of that, we got a phone call from the United Nations here in New York. Yeah. And they said, hey, boys, we, we've been impressed by the work you've done to mobilize millions of young people. Could you take that all around the world? And at that stage, we didn't even know what that meant. You know, we were like super excited. <laughs> we just projected. It seems easy to yeah. do that. <laughs> just call around the people and they come. Man. Exactly. And, and that's, that's really what led to the founding of Global Citizen. You know, we... we uh, <laughs> I, I, I got a scholarship to go to Cambridge to do a, an, a master's in economics and international relations. I went off, uh, finished that. That's where I met my wife, Taniella. We moved to New York eight years ago, and, and that's kind of where it started. You know, it, we, we, we said we don't want to look at it through a traditional charitable lens because, you know, extreme poverty is a $260 billion a year challenge. Yeah. No amount of black tie gala dinners are going to end extreme poverty. You know, we need to think about it differently. And so we said, could we bridge the current access to capital gap? Because currently all the overseas development assistance in the world from all the OECD countries only equals 150 yeah. billion. So it's $110 billion a year short per annum. And so we said, could we create a mass movement of citizens yeah. who had enough impact collectively across the sustainable development goals to ensure that political leaders all came together, united behind the United Nations blueprint for the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. Because this is the one plan that's been agreed upon by every world leader. 
the United States has signed it, Canada, my own country, Australia, the UK, mm. all of the world's nations have signed onto this plan to eradicate extreme poverty, but then the next question is, well, how do you actually operationalize it? And so we said, it's only gonna happen if we have a large enough movement of citizens mm. who use their collective influence and power to make that inevitable. And during this time also, this is when you and I met. I mean, uh, I, I spent a lot of time on the Millennium Development Goals. That was the first goals that all the global leaders uh, agreed in 2000. And, uh, and uh, you know, they had no, nothing on technology, but uh, early in 2007, 8, I was in Africa. I remember we powered up a, a village, you know, and, you know, I remember some of the children saying, hey, now we have internet, now we are, now we're existing. Yeah, that's and right. I, I, I remember it so vividly, and I, I remember crying when I saw it because shit, I take this for granted every day. Yeah. And for them, this is existing. And do you know what they did? The first thing they did when they got the connectivity, they Googled their own village to see what it was about them. Wow. Yeah, that wouldn't be the first thing I would think about, and I would call someone, or but they totally different. And so that's when I saw the technology. And then you and I met when you were doing your movement. I was part of defining uh, from the private sector what are the goals that we should agree 2015. And I take pride in that I fought for goal number 18. Yeah. That was ICT, technology and IT in every country in the world. And I severely lost because it became 17. But it was a very important time because we understood that scaling is important. You look at scaling on global citizens, I looked at scaling on technology, the only way to sort it out. But then you came back and you started the movement of global citizen and you used music again because it was a good recipe in the beginning with the first uh, concert that you had. Well, I, I, before I jump into that, I need to give you credit, Hans, because give for, those credit, you, thank you. for those of you who don't... Uh, hey, did you hear? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Hans was personally the, one of the leaders in the private sector globally who helped orchestrate not just the Sustainable Development Goal framework, but the, the precursor, the Millennium Development Goals back in the year 2000, when all of this kicked off. And there aren't that many business leaders who developed a global reputation for their ability to champion. I went to Malawi and I saw the work that you did firsthand. I, I went to a community with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and I saw the technology that you reached the most remote village and boy was I proud of you, you're awesome. <laughs> it's awesome, you, like you, you deserve it man, you're Thank awesome. You. Um, let's give him a applause. Yeah. Thank you. And so, yeah, and, and it was that time when we first yep. met. And, and uh, it was that same year, eight or nine years ago now, that my wife and I moved to New York City. And it's now our home, and we, we absolutely love it. Um, but, you know, we were still a very much a startup in those days. We, we'd, we'd started to work on global health issues. We worked on polio eradication around the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Bill and Melinda Gates took some interest in our work. Mm -hmm and said they wanted to back us. But it was really a defining moment in, in 2012 when we had this dream of running the first ever Global Citizen Festival on the Great Lawn of Central Park on a Saturday. And everyone said to us it couldn't be done. And so we asked all the artists to be involved and they all agreed if you could get the Great Lawn on a Saturday, we'll all perform for free because <laughs> no one believed we'd get it. Um, and uh, a true story, you know, we, 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 we met with Michael Bloomberg and amazingly he granted us the first Saturday since Simon and Garfunkel back in 1981. And then, uh, and then so we went back to the artists and they said, okay, are you gonna be involved now? And we were, we were, it was August and the festival was always during the UN General Assembly meeting. And we were, st we were a million and a half dollars short and no headliner. <laughs> And amazingly, Sumner Redstone from Viacom called up and said, come and meet with me. And so I flew to LA, and no kidding, he wrote a check on the spot for a million and a half dollars, and then half an hour later, Neil Young called from Hawaii and said, I want to headline the first ever Global Citizen Festival. <laughs> and that was, that was seven years ago, and we were so exhausted after that first year, we didn't know it was going to grow to where it became. But the day after year one, Stevie Wonder called and said he wanted to headline year two. And we said, there's no year two. And he said, boys, there is now. And so, uh, <laughs> and so, so that, that's what happened. And, um, and let me give you a quick recap of what's happened in the last five years to check it out. You are now
now part of the global fight to end extreme poverty. And this concert is all about giving back to the world. What is Global Citizen? Global Citizen is actually a digital platform. You go to globalcitizen.org and you start taking action in support of issues that you care about. You can take action on some of the greatest global challenges of our time, and all of these actions earn you points, and you can use these points to enter the Global Citizen Festival for free. We tweeted and called politicians and senators, and we also signed lots of petitions about various global events going on. Never before have we played for an audience 100% full of activists. We played probably every festival in the world. The audience has to do a certain amount of actions, though. I think that's such a cool thing that you can't buy your way into this thing. It's not just talking the talk. You have to actually walk the walk. I am so proud to be inspired by all of you tonight. Only all the countries together will achieve the goals of peace. We need you to tweet Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi. We're sending tweets to Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg. And if they agree to increase their support for the Global Partnership for Education, the rest of the world will follow. Norway has committed 250 million US dollars for next year. Education is a basic human right. These are our girls. They deserve the same chances to get an education as my daughters and your daughters and all of our children. I look out and I see a sea of global citizens. We can't change. The world. That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> but you, I know you're going to talk more about. I think talk also about the way you get into these concerts and how you actually made a totally different thing that nobody else has done. So. So we, we, we didn't, I mean, we were inspired by what had happened in the past with Live 8 and Live Earth, but we didn't want to think, we wanted to think, how could we use technology as the underpinner of every single thing we do? We said, how can we gamify the whole experience? So we said, let's create a points economy where all of your actions earn you points, and you can use those points to actually come to the Global Citizen Festival for free. So you can't buy tickets, it's entirely gamified. And what that does, which is so exciting, is that let's say in New York City there's 100,000 people on the Great Lawn of Central Park. Let's say 500,000 people are all trying to get those tickets and everyone has to take five actions, all of a sudden you get 2.5 million actions and if you direct all of those actions at a specific world leader, they can't possibly ignore it. To give you one <laughs> Any good examples? In a, no, I'll give you one example yeah. that you saw in the video. So Erna Solberg, the Prime Minister of Norway, with Stephen Colbert and, and Hugh Jackman, Hugh's, Hugh's one of our biggest supporters, who plays Wolverine in X-Men. Uh, Hugh... He's Australian as well. Australian also, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a, lo lo a longer story there, I'll okay, tell okay. you at some other stage. Yeah, okay. but, uh, but he... Uh, <laughs> that's a funny story, actually. Yeah, it is. But, uh, but Hugh and, and Stephen launched what we call the Twitter invasion on Norway. And we said, let's see if we can get every global citizen in the world to take action targeting Norway, because we knew that if Norway increased their investment into girls' education, then all the other Scandinavian countries would follow, because they were looking at, I'm sorry. Sweden wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I take that, accept that one. I, uh... Yeah. And so, so we, we launched this Twitter invasion, and in the first 48 hours, 500,000 tweets were all sent to Prime Minister Solberg. <laughs> and uh, her chief of staff called me the next day and said, Hugh, what are come, you come to Oslo. Yeah. And so I literally flew to next flight to Oslo. I sat opposite her like you and I are sitting here. And she said, Hugh, will you please turn the tweets off? <laughs> um, she said, I'm in the middle of a local election, and I can't see the tweets from the Norwegian people. I can only see them from the global citizens. Please turn them <laughs> off. And, and, I, and she said, what do I have to do to turn them off? And I said, well, would you come on stage and double your investment into girls' education, 250 million US dollars? Sure enough, she said, I'll do it. And then she did it. <laughs> and so it was the largest investment ever to girls' education. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I will not go into the drama between the Nordic, Nordic countries. So I'll leave that out from this conversation. Uh, but it's also a different way you have been using this tool and to, I, I would say, what is so different what you have done. You're engaging the whole communities, the whole world to make change, which is, I, I think, 
unheard of in, your, in this volume? Well, I think, you know, what we're finding is that, is that citizens are getting involved in record numbers. Like, we're getting about 27 million millennials every single month now engaged at the top end of the funnel of engagement. Many of them are then becoming registered users. Many of them are then taking action. So we're, we're structuring Global Citizen to be more like a tech company than like a traditional charity, because I think that, you know, charity 1.0 was just straight up giving philanthropy, I call it the crumbs off the table model. Mm. I think yeah. that, that 2.0 was really when we saw mass mobilization. I think 3.0 is when we integrate you know, not just product integration like you see with Tom's shoes, but actually social integration, enabling citizens to actually think about in their everyday lives, how can their habitual habits of social media, the use of technology, the use of the Global Citizen app, which I'd encourage you all to download and give us feedback because you're all technology experts and tell us what you think of the app experience. But we want to put the user first as any good technology company does. And we've decided to make it sustainable year round. We partnered with Live Nation and Ticketmaster. So now you can earn, you can earn points to every single concert in the whole world. So when Coldplay's performing in New York or when Beyonce's in London or when Jay-Z's in, 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 in Dubai, you can see them through the Global Citizen app now as a reward for your actions and your action taking. And we've also made the harder actions worth more points, obviously. Mm. So when you volunteer, it's worth a lot more than if you just send a tweet. And that's been the, the currency. But something super cool has also happened is that the artist community has yeah. also stepped up. So Chris Martin from Coldplay called me in 2015 at the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals. And he said, Hugh, I don't want to do what every artist has done. I want to do something bigger. And he, I said, what can you do? And I said, commit for the next 15 years and help us take Global Citizen all around the world. And he said, okay, I'll do it. As an, as an accountability moment around the Sustainable Development Goals, the first year he and Jay-Z helped us take it to, Af to India mm. for the first time. Um, and Prime Minister Modi got right behind it. I'll show you a quick video of that. Actually, it was super cool. Check this out. Um, let's, if we can play that one. This is, uh, this is Coldplay and Jay-Z in India. between you and Coldplay. And so we make this very, very free. Everything you want is a dream away. We are diamonds taking shape. Let's go, Will! Yeah. It's just an amazing journey because now you're taking global citizen globally because it, in the beginning it was the US. I, I just need to tell my story because I, I was actually invited to do a commitment as well and I, I, I got some carriers in the world to rally around the yeah, sustainable this, development this, goals. This, this so, is a big moment. So I got uh, uh, carriers all around the world to send out one billion SMS when the 17 goals was approved to inform the world that we now have 17 goals that everybody has agreed upon. And, and of course, together with that, you need to go on stage and commit to that. And of course, I have done some stages. And, but you know, Central Park, 80,000 people, Coldplay just behind me, and some other important people in front of me. Uh, it was a humbling experience, but uh, a great experience. And, showing how we can mobilize a lot of people around it. And of course, you inform a word about the goals. That's what we could do from the technology side. We can do so much more. But that was my experience from all this. Uh, and then I've, of course, been part of the Global Citizen many times more. Uh, if we just then think about, you started by extreme poverty. That was extreme. First of all, I mean, what do you mean by extreme poverty? I mean, mm. because eradicating extreme poverty is a big word. Right. I know you started with that, you moved into the sustainable goals and have everything from inequalities, uh, climate change and all that. But start with 
how you see extreme poverty and how, you, how important it is to eradicate it? So the, the, the World Bank defines extreme poverty as those living on less than US $1.90 per day based on purchasing power parity. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a $260 billion a year challenge. But what do I actually mean by it? Well, we don't want to conflate extreme poverty with just hunger or just income inequality. It's much more complicated than that. There are six pillars that we focus all of our work on. Firstly, food security. Secondly, gender equality. We also look at water and sanitation, global education, global health, and environmental sustainability. Now, why do we look at these pillars? Because all of these pillars are integral building blocks yeah. for the eradication of extreme yes. poverty. For example, every additional year of education a girl earns, she has an earning capacity that's 10% yeah. greater. But at the same time, if she's just in school and yet she contracts malaria, then obviously she's going to fall out of school. So you have to think of global health. But then obviously, if she's hungry and can't even afford to go to school in the first place, then so you can't just think of poverty as a one-dimensional income or just a food thing. It's not at all related to that. It's actually, I always call it the multi-dimensional challenge. And anyone who says that there's a silver bullet for poverty alleviation is joking. There's, whether it's microfinance or direct giving or any of the above, they're all valuable, but not a single intervention is enough by itself. You have to think about them in unison, and that's critical if you truly want to get to the heart of these issues. And I think this is the heart of uh, also where technology plays a vital role. Many of these challenges can at least have an enabler in technology. That's right. Uh, if you think about uh, health, uh, remote medicine and things like that, I mean, we, some of us sitting in this room, we're coming from a world where we take it for granted, and maybe our barrier for, for having remote medicine is quite high. I can tell you, if you don't have a doctor, you have never seen one, you happily take a, a remote doctor. Uh, that would be enormous. And if you have never had education in the classroom and, and you think that is the way you're doing it, you're very happy to get the remote education or, or uh, e-learning because, but you need technology for it. That's the only way we can scale. And that's why you and I found each other talking about the technology. We cannot do everything ourselves. It's not one thing. It has to hang together. It's exactly right. And, and you know, th this week we worked on a, a blockchain uh, project um, with IBM, actually. Oh, you're really and, advanced. And, and what we're trying to think through is how can the blockchain be used to actually increase accountability around aid giving? Yeah. Because aid giving, when a donor makes a multi-billion dollar pledge, how do you make sure it ends up in the, the hands of those who need it most? And, and these new advanced technologies do provide amazing mechanisms for that to occur. And I think that as technologists, you have at your fingertips the tools for mass mobilization of people, for media and communications, yeah. for, for utilizing um, accountability and, and measurement tools. You really can change the world. Yeah. And that's why it excites me so much um, with the potential. To give you one cool example of, of that kind of accountability piece, a few years ago, uh, Rihanna asked, we, we talked to her about headlining Global Citizen in Central Park. Mm -hmm. And her manager, Jay Brown, who's a dear friend, said, you know what, Rihanna wants to headline Central Park, but she also wants to change the world for global education. And so two years ago, we started on a campaign with her to try to see if we could raise more money for global education than had ever been secured before. And we started with this idea of trying to engage the French government, because uh, we knew when Hollande was in power, we knew that we wanted him to be an early giver. But then when Macron came to power, we said to President Macron, would you consider hosting the Global Partnership for Education's replenishment alongside Rihanna? And in doing so, could we get many of the other G7 and G20 leaders to come to the table and make what could be the largest ever pledge for global education. Uh, it happened, and, and uh, I want to share with you very quickly what happened, because it was very cool, this, this campaign. Education is the best investment we can make for a prosperous, peaceful, equitable, and future-ready world. For this, GPE is joining forces with Global Citizen the Clara Lionel Foundation and its founder, our new global ambassador, Rihanna.
I don't worry that uh, I'm don't eat in the morning because I believe in the future when I will be a businessman, I will have more food. In Malawi, 73.5% of students get into primary school, but only 8% get to complete secondary school. And that's a huge issue. The dropouts are coming up because of poverty. The challenges that girls face is long distances. A girl might travel 13 kilometers away from home just one way. I really feel that nothing is more important for our future than education. We want to raise 3.1 billion for the coming years. And, uh, and, and the cool thing about that is I can, I'm pleased to report that in January this year, Emmanuel Macron came with Rihanna to Senegal and they raised $2.3 billion. Wow. So, um, so it was good. So, Basically, yeah. same concept. You, you get the Nordists actually reaching out to world leaders, rally around and get everyone engaged. Absolutely. And using, using technologies. I mean, yeah. the great thing about this world is like information is democratized. Yeah. You can communicate with a world leader as much as you can communicate with anyone. It, it's the power of the world we live in now. It's changed dramatically. When I first started, you know, back in, in 2002, 2003, you know, there wasn't even any social media, like we, like I think MySpace was still cool, you know, and then, uh, and that was it's still okay. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's when it all yeah. started, you know, yeah. and and like and and now you can use plug-in technology. Yeah. You can use any type of technology to integrate deeply. It's awesome. No, and and what we all need to understand is we're we're less than half of the or the population of the world has still access to internet, so it's. Roughly some 3 billion people have access to internet. That's over 6 billion people on Earth. We still have half to go. And just imagine the massive improvements you can do by using technology. And when I came out from this uh, uh, sustainable development goals and there was no goal for ICT, I basically learned that in all these goals that are main challenge on Earth, all of them have included technology that we do here at Verizon every day, the mobility, the broadband, the cloud services can enable things, uh, if it's for education, healthcare, whatever it might be. So I realized that it was probably better than not have 18 goals, instead having technology enable all of the 17. And I, and I even had a work with Jeffrey Sachs to see that how can you accelerate the achievement of the 17 goals by using technology, and it was clear in order to secure and accelerate it, and it's everything you talk about, social media, but it's also infrastructure where governments are providing service for the citizens in a totally different way in order to reach the goal. So for me, this has been a, an enormous journey, but I also see that like, technology companies like us, we have a big portion yeah. and actually impact in our society, doing what we're doing every day in this company, which is also coming back to the private sector, how important that piece has been of doing it uh, when you come to your global cities and, and engaging corporations, which has been a big part of your work as well. It has been a huge part of our work. You know, we're fortunate that I'd say corporate America has really embraced the, the, what the movement can achieve. You know, brands like, like Citibank or Johnson & Johnson or Procter & Gamble and, and houses of brands like Cody and, and uh, and, and so many wonderful Gucci have got behind us since the very beginning. Yeah. And, they've, and the cool thing about that is it's enabled us to not compete with any other charity out there. In fact, 80% of our revenue as an organization comes through corporate partners. Mm. And so what that means is we can partner with a UNICEF or a Save the Children or a CARE or others as a platform of engagement because most of their financing is coming from user to user to yeah. build program to program, school, hospital, teacher training program, et cetera, et cetera. And we're able to use our platform to amplify their work. So 
when you see the, the financing that's raised through the, the multi-billion dollars that's raised from Global Citizen Stage actually supports the organizations. So for example, UNICEF's a huge partner of ours. The World Health Organization's a huge partner of ours um, because we want to have to make sure that vast sums of additional financing is actually directed at the most efficient and effective places. So before I will open up for question, I think it's one thing that I know, but I, I just want to close the circle. Remember what they talked, you were talked about uh, in the beginning, about his childhood and the background in, in Manila, you met Sunny Boy. So last year, uh, when you opened up the Global Citizen, the day before I was there, you, you talked about the story, how it ended. And I, <laughs> I still get emotional, but, but you tell the story. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, this is one of the things I don't, I don't talk about publicly because it's very emotional yeah. uh, for me. So, yeah, I mean, and it, it, it very much shows the way in which technology can change the world. So I met Sunny Boy when, when we were 14 years old in the Philippines. I'm, I just turned 35, and so that was 20 years ago. And when I left, it was before the age of the internet. Yeah. 1998, and he gave me his address on a piece of paper. I put it in my jeans, and, and I unfortunately lost his address. And, and in that, I thought we'd lost contact forever. Uh, two years ago, I was invited to do a TED talk about our work. And this is the amazing thing about how small our world is now. I got a phone call from the lady who, who lived on Smoky Mountain, still working there this day an incredible woman by the name of Anne, and she called me and she said, Hugh, you'll never believe it, but I think 20 years later, I think we've found Sunny Boy. And so six months ago, for the first time, uh, a year ago now, I had the, had the opportunity to meet him again for the first time. It, it was full on. You know, the, it, you know, this is, the, the, in many ways for me, it just reinforced the urgency of the need to act more. He, he's still living on the same slum in the center of Manila. His life hasn't improved a great deal. No. He's still living on $5 a day, sorry, $5 a day for all his family of 10. And, uh, you know, and I said to him, you know, what's, what's the hope? How can we help you? And this is this was the amazing thing. He said, Hugh, my hope is not for me, it's for my kids. I need them to get an education. Will you, will you fund that? And so we set up a small fund to, to ensure not just his kids, but every kid in the community can, can go to school now. And um, interestingly for him, I said, what, what do you want personally? He said, I want to be connected to the world. Yeah. You know what, yeah, this is the amazing thing. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is not always that true. He said, Hugh, would you ever consider buying me a cell phone? And I'm not joking. He said, would you consider buying me a cell phone? Because all I'd like to do is be connected with the world. And I was like, far out. <laughs> you know, it was... Oh, uh, while you is uh, uh, recovering from that emotional moment, because it is emotional, I was there when you talked about it last time. It was equal emotion that time. Probably even worse this time. Um, it's a good story. It's a fantastic story. How that changed your whole world and uh, your whole life and what you're doing right now. Uh, guys, I'm now going to ask you to see whatever questions you have for you, what is doing, what is happening around Global Cities. I have some more, but I just want you to open up and see, is there any questions out there? Yes, I see. The head of strategy of Verizon. That could be a very tricky question, yes or no. You, I can help you out if there's something. <laughs> Are you guys recovered? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, all of what you're doing is amazing. And when you think about the challenges that you, you see all of these people facing, it seems insurmountable. Mm. But it is all about the little movements that we can make. Yeah. What would you ask of us? Well. Well, I would just ask for your creativity, most of all, because I, I, I believe it with all my heart that you have within the Verizon network all the tools that you could possibly need to change the world. 
you have the best media outlets in Yahoo and Oath and, and all of that. You have the best technologies. True story, when I first started with Make Poverty History, the first partner that ever got on board with us was a telecommunications company. It was Singtel with, with Optus, because we were in Australia. Yeah. And, um, and we saw how technology can mobilize citizens for good. And I believe right now the world needs inspiration and hope Matt, now more than ever. There's so much negativity. You know, there's so much, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. There's so much hate, hatred here, hatred there. Be the company of hope. Be the company of inspiration. Use your creativity and inspire people. I had the privilege of catching up with a gentleman who works with Verizon, Diego Scotti, recently, thanks to Hans' introduction. He told me about your passion as a company for education. You could turbocharge that in the US and globally. But to have a global outlook and, and make your, your, connect your local actions with your global actions. One, one example, to give you an example of that, is a couple of weeks ago I was in South Africa and I met this incredible young woman and she was trying to combat stunting amongst kids in Africa. 27% of the children in South Africa are stunted as a result of malnutrition. And she said on a very local level, we're gonna to try to tackle this through giving women during childbirth eggs, highly nutritious eggs, so that they can give them to their kids when they're born, so, that, so they have the most nutritious food when they're born to combat stunting. But then there's another simple thing. She said, you know what we're gonna do? We're also gonna advocate for our government to partly subsidize eggs during childbirth so that these poorest women can actually afford them. This is where you can join a connection between a hyper-local action and a public policy that can change the world. And I believe you at Verizon have the tools to do both. You can both inspire people through the power of local action and the power of one single citizen and how that can connect to global change. You've got an amazing leadership team in Hans, and I know I've had the privilege of meeting some of your other leadership team recently. You have all the right ingredients. Get together. I'll, I'll come with you, I'll brainstorm. I love this sort of thing, as you can tell. <laughs> you know, brainstorm how you can change the world. You have all the tools, the best media in the world. You can do it. And, and, and start, I would say, pick a single issue like global education that you could champion and think about how can you play that out locally here in the United States, locally in other parts of the world and globally from a public policy point of view. You can do it. Yeah. Wow. More questions? Don't be shy. This group usually has a lot of questions, you know. Yes. We're going to get the microphone either here. All right, I'm ready. Yes. Oh. Boom. Good, good catch. Hi. What's your name? Thank you. My name is Elise. It's Hi, nice Elise. to meet you. Good to meet you. Um, I love that. Hope is an anchor for the soul, so thank you for that. I'm curious in your acceleration efforts, as you talked about other global organizations, whether it's World Vision or Compassion, et cetera, utilizing your platform. I think in this, um, so one, can you just Tell me more about that and how you use the technology and platform that you've established to accelerate others yeah. in a world where traditionally it is the crumbs on the table. I want to keep them for my, for my use, for my charity versus, you know, there's a finite number of resources. We'd love to hear more. Yeah. So there's kind of a double pronged question. So I'll, I'll try to answer both if I may. Um, in answer to the second part of your question about traditional charity, there's this great TED talk I'd encourage you to see by a gentleman by the name of Dan Pallada, and it's, it's called why, why the Way We Think About Charity is Dead Wrong. You watched it? Watched you it. did? Phenomenal. It's awesome, isn't it? Dan's a good friend of mine, and um, you got you got you got to watch it. It's a killer talk, um, and it's a very simple idea, but very powerful. It talks about how the origins of charity itself came from like a Protestant work ethic notion where it literally was crumbs off the table. Rather than actually using creativity to spur innovation that could actually solve the world's biggest challenges. That's why I love how modern technologists are thinking about changing, changing the, the game for, for traditional charity. As it relates to the first part of your question, how do we work with other charities and how do we enable them to use our platform? Well, we do a couple things. Firstly, because we have a platform, globalcitizen.org and the app, we actually enable them to put their own actions on our platform. So say World Vision will, or CARE or UNICEF or Save the Children will come to us and say, we want to put this action on your platform. We'd like to encourage 
your millennials to engage. We tend to have a younger audience than many of them, and so they say, could we do that? And we then actually, in some cases, even share the data with them. If subject to our T's and C's, we say, yeah, if those citizens take action on that issue, they can actually become supporters of your organization. If we create a bigger pie, it's bigger for everyone. And um, we also then say to them, come on stage and use our festival platform to advance your issues. So for example, Carol Stern from UNICEF or, or Tony Lake when he was the former head of UNICEF before the, the, the new CEO now, we actually work with them to say, okay, you're trying to raise money for, for refugees in emergency situations through this fund called the Education Cannot Wait Fund or Education and Emergencies Financing Mechanism. And we said, could you actually encourage other world leaders to come on stage and use the power of the platform? They're gonna be in town during UN General Assembly week. Use the power of the platform and get them to commit to support you. And the charities love that because we're giving them visibility. They're giving, we're, we're taking a non-competitive approach because I just don't believe in our space there's time for that. Um, we've got to end extreme poverty by 2030. We're all trying to achieve the same thing. So let's be mission driven, you know? And so that's the way we do it. We give them access to the platform, access to the technology. We even share data subject to our T's and C's and make sure that that can grow their pie, their group of supporters to become bigger and better. Yeah. Good. More questions? Here. Hi, Andrea Caldini. Um, so when you look at charities, some of the challenges is how do you make sure, one, the charities that are on your platform, most of the money is going to the people that need it? Because that's one thing you see is sometimes some of the charities, 50% go to the charity people yeah. and only a portion go out to the people. So how do you ensure that? And then some of the governments that you deal with, how do you make sure it doesn't get stuck there and not get out? Great, great questions. Awesome. So. Um, I'll answer the second question first again. So the governments, so we've partnered with PricewaterhouseCoopers now to independently audit every single announcement that's made on the global citizen stage. So if you're a world leader and you make an announcement in front of our <laughs> tens of thousands of people, you will be audited. And we actually have now, no, it's true, we actually ha we have to make sure they follow through on it. It's not good just to have a press moment, they have to follow through on it. And so now world leaders have told us they've even had to set up their own auditing teams in-house to help meet our rigorous standards of accountability. And when world leaders don't, then we give them a chance to rectify it. Firstly, privately, we say, listen, you're off track with your announcement. And I'm pleased to tell you that of the 283 announcements that have been made on, by world leaders on global citizen stages in the last five years, only three have not been followed through on out of 283. Only three. And one was because the government was thrown out of power. Um, one, was one was because of, due to a natural disaster. And the third one was unfortunately my country of Australia because of a change in government. So, so um, the, the, the reason why I'm telling you this is that the auditing process is immensely powerful. It actually forces them a high degree of accountability. On the very rare moment, that they're off track and they refuse to rectify it, which happens like almost never, on the very rare moment, then that time we will publish it publicly. So on our board, Ariana Huffington's on our board, uh, Randall Lane from Forbes Magazine's on our board, we're very close with the New York Times team and Arthur Salzberger Jr. is a dear friend. We work with them to publish the information, very rare occasions. One example when we did do it, was, and sorry, I just gotta share this example, it's funny. The, 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 Den, the, the, the Danish foreign minister a few years ago sent us a tweet saying, why won't you allow us on the global citizen stage? I'm surprised he sent us a tweet publicly, but he did. And, uh, and we said, well, you've just cut foreign aid by $287 million. And sure enough, the next, the next day on the front page of the Danish newspaper was, Danish foreign minister not allowed on stage because Dan Denmark's cut foreign aid by $287 million. And so that's the power of the movement and that's the power of technology. Accountability matters. Um, in answer to your first part of your question around how, to, how do we engage with traditional charities, well, two things I'd say on that. Firstly, I'd encourage you to watch this TED talk I just mentioned about why the way we think about charity is dead wrong. Please, it will, it will hopefully inform some of my perspective on this issue and, and also certainly Dan Pilata's perspective. But the second thing I'd say is that we, 
always work with the most reputable financing mechanisms in the world. And so if you look across the sustainable development goals, food, education, water and sanitation, global health, the empowerment of girls and women, there are certain funds, macro funds, like Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the Global Fund to fight HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, also, um, also the Global Partnership for Education. All of those funds are independently audited and you can track the dollar literally from the donor contribution right through to the project on the ground. And in most cases, their financial overhead is covered separately, in, say, by the World Bank or by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or others. So it actually doesn't detract from that. The other thing I'd say is that the reason why we know the money ends up there is that there is no secondary market for, say, a malaria bed net or there's no secondary market for a antiretroviral drug. So when you're delivering services like that, there's no black market for it anyway. They don't, no one's gonna try to resell your malaria bed nets for additional $5 over here. So you, you know it's ending up in the hands of, of the people who need it most. On rare occasions, you'll read stories of when a malaria bed net might have been used as a fishing net instead. But I say, well, if they can catch fish with it also, that's fantastic, you know? <laughs> and so that's, and that's very rare, yeah. You Evans, I, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I, I, I wish the world had more guys like you. Uh, the impact of you done in your young life, you're young still, um, and what you're gonna do in the future is uh, amazing. I think we as a company, we are doing a lot of things in, in, on the society and uh, with our technology and what we're doing in the future is going to be closer and closer to us. Much of the technology has impacted co consumers first, then industries and now society. And it's a reason for us to think about all of that when we continue to deploy our technology and our services that we do across this country and globally. So I heartful thank you for uh, joining us here, both on Instagram, but <laughs> Also here in Basking Reed at the Verizon Tech Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Thanks a lot.